Hi, my name is Tom Doyle, and I was Les Paul's right-hand man and producer of his shows, as well as his guitar tech. So let me tell you a few things about the row of pickups that I have here. The first one actually was because Les, his idol was Django Reinhardt, and this is a Stimmer pickup from one of Django's original guitars. So you can see it says Stimmer right on it. So this was impressive to Les, and he wanted to hear what that sounded like compared to what he was doing. And so we'll start off with that as a pickup and from the 19, mid-1930s, okay, a little bit later, maybe, 37. Anyway, and then the second one would be, this is the guts of a uh, Epiphone electric guitar, and Les always enjoyed that kind of pickup, and if, if you really want to realize what this was, those are all individual magnets, but a controllable magnets. In other words, you could screw them up and down. This is pretty unique for its time. And so then you would put a coil around it, like this second one has a coil wrapped around it. Now that's less putting that coil around it. That's not Epiphone. Epiphone would actually put a, uh, let's see what that, that says. I think it, can you see what that says on it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that would be 39 gauge wire and there's 3,500 turns aside, I believe, so, something like that. But Les said he wanted to go low impedance. So... What we have wrapped around this uh, uh, magnets that are like these is one of his coils, which is 24 gauge wire and about 300 turns on that. Now Les is also trying to figure out how he could do some humbucking. And so now we have the second coil, which is really a, what we call an air coil and out of phase with the first coil. And he actually has a, a iron load on one side, actually should be for the bass strings on that side. Anyway, and that would be a way of getting humbucking back in 19, uh, well, actually 1946, 47, 48. He was fooling around with it then. And then he used this on the, on the first gold tops as well. And uh, you can see that uh, coming up on this next pickup, which is actually a, a D-Armin pickup right here. Now, the D-Armin pickup he kind of liked, but he didn't like the uh, way it responded on the bass side. Uh, for him. He, he didn't think it was clear enough. So what he did, he actually took the original winding off of the bobbin of this, the arm and pickup, and rewound it with 24 gauge wire again. The difference was he could only get 150 turns on that. So naturally the level of that pickup was not going to be as much as a level as this. But it was clear and clean and so he could plug this in directly into his uh, amplifier and get a beautiful sound out of it and that was later on used on his first gold top. The next point of view is now he realized he thought maybe he should try to make a bobbin because here were here were the uh, uh, the early staple type pickups that were on Gibson uh, his Gibson uh, actually the Black Beauty guitars and so he decided well he'll wrap wire around that but that became a kind of a problem as you can see <laughs> and the problem with that was is that you didn't have a real bobbin to keep the wire set in a spot that would make sense around the magnets. So then he started to come up with, well, if I take one of those uh, P90, well, actually, this is the uh, uh, Alnico pickups that were in the uh, uh, guitar, such as the, uh, you know, the Black Beauty. He then he took two of these bobbins and put them together. So now we have a lot of a lot of room to put all of that wire inside here, which would be 300 turns, okay? So what you're seeing here is, is what was really on his first gold top. He took a DeArmond pickup, and, and it was actually a cover that had no holes in it at all, and he drilled it with a drill press, that's why it's so elongated, and then started using a, a deeper bobbin so he could put under that pickup, which was a P90 originally, he then drilled the holes this, was, this actually was a cover that had no holes in it that he got from Gibson, and then he drilled holes in it to fit the DeArmond pickup right here. And that would fit in there, you see. Not perfectly, but that was the way he was doing it with what he had to work with. So now, as time goes by, he's now realizing that he could take a, a regular P90 uh, pickup for the uh, bridge pickup and modify that as well. And so he was do, doing, here's the regular coil for a P90 pickup and it's very thin. You're not gonna put 24 gauge wire in that bobbin. It's just not gonna happen. So he used the same process here, but with a P90 
uh, guts, so to speak, the screws, and did the same thing on that rear pickup or the uh, bridge pickup. People say, well, how can, how can he play this guitar? Because he's now low impedance, and that is true. So the way that is done, he came up with using a, uh, a transformer, which is a UTC transformer called an 01-ouncer, if you can see that. And that would be 50, 200, and 500 ohms, I believe it says on there. I don't have my glasses to see that. But anyway, uh, and that's what he would use. That was used in, in, these were used, these transformers were used in boards of the time. They were the finest transformer you could buy for, for uh, boosting up the level from low impedance to high. So what you could get out of this transformer was 50 ohms if you go in there, 200 ohms and 500 ohms, and you can come out 20K. So now you're at high impedance, you go right into a Fender amplifier and you're matching it perfectly. These are now pickups. Again, here we go with an extended bobbin on it. The extended bobbin on this one is actually the same as the DeArmin bobbins. I mean, not the bobbin, but the guts of the bobbin. Same as that, but he decided to make his own bobbin completely. And so you can see he took a piece of plexiglass on the bottom and a top of actually plexiglass, black plexiglass, and drilled holes had a machinist drill holes in that, and he could use the guts of the DeArmin in this pickup. So we're, we're really seeing how he evolved with these, these pickups. It's just amazing what he has done. This is just a small sample. Now these are uniquely different. These are pickups that he was using later on as SG, uh, when the SG came out in 61, I believe it was, and uh, 1961, I believe. And if I'll turn it over, I'll show you that you can't see any bobbin, you can't see any magnet, you can't see anything. You can just see fiberglass covered and he molded over the coil. And so what he did, he put he put tabs on either side. Now this one's incomplete. Uh, this was incomplete and this is complete. So this one is painted black and then he had two ends that you actually drove the nails into the wood so he's really making contact with the resonance of the wood of the guitar. How interesting, huh? This man was amazing. He he really was constantly thinking, never stopping. And every day, when I was working with him, we were changing things on the guitars every day. It could be in the morning and in the afternoon and at night. And staying up all night, he would then think about what to do the next day. It was just amazing. Now we're getting into the coil size that would be eventually what he would be calling his uh, uh, recording guitar coils. And these were now truly humbucked. We get one on top of the other. We were really humbucking them completely. With an Alnico 5 or an Alnico 8 magnet, depending on how much he wanted to get level out of the pickup. There were, this is one that's more complete where you can see they're actually the same size wire. They're both connected together. And that, that would be truly humbucking, which one on top of the other. It's piggybacked. This was uh, some other, other experiments. He made a, a bobbin uh, coil and a bobbin sort of like a plate in between. And he was trying to isolate the two coils even more and that was done on this pickup here which you can't see the inside but that's that's that one now over here i'm going to sit down uh, this is actually uh, the first cover he was having made by gibson which is vacuum formed there's nothing in it there's no uh, studs in it to, to screw it into uh, the uh, you know a fixture on the guitar but he used this first to try using this method in here he then began to get these, which now are epoxied and actually uh, cast, uh, in, you, know, you actually put a, a capsule material inside to stop it from vibrating, and that's the reason for it. Not so much to hide what's in there, but actually you didn't want to have ex extraneous vibration that could cause hum or whistle or that kind of a feedback problem. And now we're back into Gibson actually putting the names on these and making them. They're about, uh, what did I figure these out, about a pound and a half, something like that. They're quite heavy because you're talking about giant magnets in there as well as, uh, you know, the encapsulate material, which really when that's poured in, it adds another half a pound in that as well. This is now a pickup which was kind of, uh, I had sort of my idea and he decided that he would like to have a pickup with one, like a humbucker, but large to make one coil on this side and a coil on this side, and a plate to connect the two magnets together underneath. You can see that there's actually a plate connecting the two magnets. And so that gives a very powerful low impedance pickup. Not necessarily the cleanest sound, but he was trying it out. And this one here 
This is really unique in that it, I have to put my glasses on this again. This is actually a pickup that I used on an L5. And if you look in Les Paul's book, Les Paul in his own words, you'll see where this pickup was actually sitting on, a, on an angle like that, looking that way, or that way I should say. It's like an angle, like, and this is the places where he would screw it into that body. He didn't care that he was chopping up a brand new L5 or an L4 or, you know, 225. He just he didn't care. It was all experimentation. Nothing to him meant anything. It's just a tool to find out what would happen. It, truly empirical learning and training himself to know with notes what each thing did for him and whether he liked it or not. It later on came down to uh, a pickup like this, which is more high impedance. He was now wondering how he could make a high impedance pickup in sort of a form like the original low impedance ones that are humbucked like this. So he was now doing that here. And these were uh, also done in low impedance wire as well, 26 wire, 20, he calls it 26 wire, 250 turns on this one. And this has a special uh, pole piece, which I helped him design as well. That's, a, that's actually a, a slot. A, 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 the pole piece itself is not the magnet. The magnet is actually on the bottom. These are now uh, piezo pickups that he was working on also. I know he had two guild guitars that I worked on, and these were on those guilds to try to make them the first, some of the early first uh, piezo pickups on the bridge. These were acoustic round hole guitars. They're also in the book uh, pictured, uh, Les Paul in his own words. Later on, this was a mock-up of what he thought we could put piezo, uh, actually piezos in each one of these saddles. And you could you could screw them up and down to match the you know radius of the fingerboard and the strings. This was just a mock-up. This does not work. Then he started getting into more high impedance pickups, and we're now into 42 gauge and 5,000 turns into trying to modifying a sound of of what was later to become a, a pickup that he was trying to develop, and I helped with that as well. And later on, he did not finish this. This is one two where he did humbucking one on top of the other. But he did not finish that, and uh, Max and I were the ones that uh, actually completed his ideas later on, and that's the Doyle coils, as you may know. Now, over here, I just wanted to show uh, what the electronics were, what he was using, the early low impedance electronics. This is quite interesting. These pots are anywhere from uh, 2.5K to 1,000 ohms, and we were using very, he was using very large caps that he had, and it's usually army surplus, like this kind of switching network here. And also, he didn't have a transformer in this at all. He had that on the line going out. He had a line transformer in the cable. So the first Les Paul recording guitars were actually with a line cable with a matching transformer. And then he later on converted to putting the transformer right there, right in here. It's hard to see, but right inside here. So now the transformer was now converting the low impedance into high, coming out directly to the amp guitar amplifier. This is a little interesting thing. This is his guitar setup. This was no transformer on this. This is just directly into the board and straight guitar, and it was bass, treble, and volume. Very much the same thing he used later on on his recording guitars, personal and uh, you know, signature guitars as well. But that was a, a test bed that he would test them with that little unit. So it gives you an idea, you have a better understanding of how this was all evolved and how it all came about. Now I just went through maybe <laughs> 25 years, maybe 30 years of training, trying different things in this. And that's what Les would do every day. Hope you enjoyed that. Thank you. Tom Doyle here.